All right, well, thank you for that, that introduction and for the invitation to come here and share some of the research um, that we've been doing around that sort of interaction, that nexus between politics and, uh, and donations. But before we get into that, since I have a little bit of a captive audience, I want to share at least a little bit about what we do at the Institute for Nonprofits in case many of you haven't, haven't heard of us at, at NC State. Um, you can see sort of our, our mission up here and this idea of being a community is really important to what we do because building community is what's going to help folks, building that social capital is going to help folks be able to solve their problems going forward. We do this through research, education, and engagement. Uh, give you an idea of some of the types of activities that we do. We, the cornerstone program of our institute is an undergraduate minor in nonprofit studies. That is an intentionally liberal studies approach to help uh, undergraduate students understand the role of nonprofits and philanthropy in society. About 47% of our alums go on to work in the nonprofit sector, about another quarter go into government, and the balance go into the private sector. So we're not, at the undergraduate level, we're not training sort of that next generation of nonprofit employees necessarily, but we want to, in to create engaged citizens who can be better board members and better volunteers for our community serving organizations. Uh, we have a graduate certificate in nonprofit management, and that is where folks learn those technical skills to run and manage nonprofit organizations more effectively and more efficiently. Uh, the Institute for Nonprofits is actually located, our offices are in Hunt Library, so we are on Centennial Campus. So even though we are part of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, we are in the heart of the tech campus at NC State. So we bump into a lot of engineers and, and folks working in textiles, and students these days don't want to just write code or make widgets, they want to have positive impact and purpose in the work that they do. So we've created a program called our Social Innovation Fellows Programs, where we take uh, folks from second year undergraduates through PhD students and put them through what we call our discover design and do good process where they work with a community partner solving real world problems in a multidisciplinary team. So we have anthropologists working with biologists working with mechanical engineers ar around problems. We do some uh, community engaged work so we have our leadership fellows academy where we partner uh, with the state to deliver training to folks who are starting up or working in peer support organizations for people in recovery from substance use disorder, mental health disabilities, and uh, developmental disabilities. Trying to build out that group of nonprofit organizations out there that can deliver the recovery services across our state. And finally, if you aren't aware of it, um, please visit philanthropyjournal.org. That is an online publication that comes out of our shop at the Institute that is a free resource for nonprofit organizations and their supporters, not just in North Carolina, but across the, across the globe. So that gives you a, a bit of an idea of the portfolio of the types of things that we, uh, that we do at the Institute. Give a recognition here. This research that I'm talking about today is not just me, but, um, but I, I have three co-authors that have worked with, uh, worked with me on this project. Um, all of the really good ideas are theirs, all the bad ones are, are mine, um, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go there. And give you an idea of what the, of what the agenda is, how I see our discussion uh, sort of flowing today. Uh, you, you invited a professor here, so definitions are going to be important and theory is going to happen, so I apologize in advance if, that, uh, if you thought you, you got beyond some of those discussions. Talk a little bit about a brief debate about who is more generous or giving, whether it's Republicans or, or Democrats, and then we'll talk about how our research fits into some of that discussion that's going on and some key takeaways. If there is time, depending on how things go, I'll also give a little bit of information about the scope of nonprofits and philanthropy across, uh, across North Carolina. Uh, I'm relatively informal, so one, right, I'm used to talking an hour and 15 minute blocks and I was only told I have 50 minutes, so I'll try to be, honor that. Uh, but also feel free to ask questions as, as we go along. All right, so definition. Philanthropy, philia. I think this is really important and one of the things that I've been trying to do at the Institute is actually reclaim what philanthropy is. Philanthropy is not something wealthy people do to or for poor people. Philanthropy is a social relationship. We are all philanthropists. Philanthropy is about caring about human beings for no other reason than you're a fellow human being. Okay? It is this idea of that friendship, that affection for others. That's what I want us to think about what philanthropy is. And that becomes important in the context of the research that, that we're talking about here. Uh, one, we're actually missing a lot of philanthropy in our data. 
right? Our data is donations given to formal 501c3 nonprofit organizations, including, including churches and synagogues and, and houses of worship. We know that philanthropy, this social relationship, acts differently in different communities. African Americans practice philanthropy different than, than the major, than majority populations in the country. Those sorts of donations to friends, to family, to community members, that doesn't get counted in these official statistics. So it's sort of one thing to think about as you think about philanthropy and the broader idea of what the social relations means, the way we collect our data don't truly reflect the breadth and depth of what philanthropy means in the United States and how we, and how we practice it. It also, sort of one of the, potentially what, what can be seen as one of the sort of concerning results of our research is that the more divided we are in our communities, the less we're willing to engage in this relationship with others. So if we truly want to think about philanthropy as a social relationship, we have to think about how do we build bridges? How do we build that bond, that bridging social capital so that we're interacting with folks who don't necessarily think like us politically? Because until we can start humanizing each other rather than demonizing each other, we're not going to be able to come together in diverse communities to actually solve our, our collective problems. So thinking about philanthropy in this way, as this sort of a social relationship, rather than just what wealthy people do to others, becomes an important way to think about maybe some policies that we can think about to, to improve society. All right, a little bit of context. A little bit of a disturbing idea going on here. So if we look at the trends of donations, on the one hand, donations tend to be increasing. Total amounts donated tend to be increasing. But if we look at the percentages of households that are donating over, over the last um, 10 to, to 20 years, the percentage of households donating is actually decreasing. We have fewer people taking part, at least in this one expression, of philanthropy. And if we see philanthropy as a way for people to come together and solve, their, solve our community's problems as an important feed into that, this can be a little bit of a, of a concerning trend. And as we become more divided as, as a country, this, may, this, this trend uh, may, may continue to, to go on. And we can see that this isn't just going on in secular giving. Religious giving is impacted in here, in here as well. So this, this trend of, of the number of individuals or households that are giving decreasing over time raises some potential questions about how we can, how we can solve our community problems. A little bit of theory. The median voter theory, um, part of this idea, what does it take to get elected? What does it take for a politician to get elected? Money, Money right, votes, right? The most votes, right? 50% plus one vote is what, it takes to get, is what it takes to get elected. We'll forget the electoral college for a while and, and focus on this. Um, so, there, so political scientists and political economists and, and, uh, have come up with this idea of the median voter theory. And, and what this is pointing out is that if people want to be elected, the most votes are sort of here in the middle. So we sort of get these sort of median, this middle sort of policy preferences. One of the reasons why nonprofits exist, sort of one of the theories of the nonprofit sector is that, that we can only come together on so much of our preferences of a particular policy being, being delivered. And then that's where philanthropy comes in to fill some of those unmet needs over here. So let's think about this for public safety for a second. Okay, we can have zero amount of public safety or 100% of public safety, right? If we put a lot of money and built out large police forces, right? Maybe we would have 100% of, of our public safety needs met. But we're somewhere sort of here in the middle based on what we're willing to tax ourselves as, as a community. But there are people out there that have higher levels of preferences for public safety. How does the nonprofit sector come in to fill this, this gap? What are some ways that you can think of? Volunteer fire departments. Okay, so volunteer fire departments is one, is one way to go. So we have people who are volunteering to take part of this public safety. What else? <laughs> Neighborhood watches is another way to go. So community watches, people coming together to volunteer is another way that we sort of add our, our time and our treasure to, to fill up and, and provide more of this public good. There's another important one. Most churches have outreach that donates to various charitable 
No, that's absolutely true. But think about public safety in, in particular, right? No, not Red Cross. Homeowners associations. We build gated communities and then hire private security to protect us. Most homeowners associations are not, they're not charitable organizations, but they are nonprofit organizations. So we, there's lots of ways that nonprofits can come into being to provide some additional uh, levels of, of, public service, of public service goods. One of the things that we're doing with our research is to try to look at this relationship between how we tax ourselves and what impact that has on our philanthropy in addition to what, this, what is going on with, um, with the uh, political competition uh, and, and ideology. So a little bit of a, of a debate, okay? The literature is a little bit unsettled about who is more, and people use this word generous. Generous, once again, is a wrong term to use, giving most of the data that, they, that people have. Uh, it's who gives more donations. Republicans or Democrats, this is just part of that, that sort of ideological fight that goes on. Uh, Art Brooks and others point to some research that says Republicans, once you control for lots of things, tend to be more generous than Democrats. Wolf Bielefeld and others will say that um, you know, Democrats are, are more generous and a lot of it has to do with where the data are coming from and the types of sources that people are using. And then finally, there's some work by um, Paul Shervis and John Havens that says, well, it's sort of both. And we're building off of their work. What they have done is they've looked at um, giving across the 50 states and controlling for tax burden, controlling for cost of living, and, and lots of other things. When they start ranking which states give sort of higher amounts um, relative to the adjusted gross income that gets done, that's really mixed. There are some states that are, that are deep blue that are high up on the list, and there are some that are deep red that are high up on the list. So what they're trying to say is that there's, it's a lot more complicated story than just Republican versus Democrat when it comes to understanding how much people give. And that's what we're building off here. Instead of looking at it at a state level, we're looking at things on a, on a county level. So what we're looking at is the relationship between voluntary and involuntary forms of wealth redistribution, right? So voluntary redistribution, that would be our donations. Involuntary distribution, that's the state exercising its confiscatory powers to separate you from your money to achieve public goods. Um, all of our key variables are done at the county level. So we're aggregating data at the county level. We can't talk about our individual Republicans more, more generous than individual Democrats. We're just looking at, at county level averages. Our key dependent variable is the adjusted gross income. So this is using our, our the, from the statistics of income files, so all the 1040 um, reports at the county level. And the key is the percent of adjusted gross income and it's not just the percent of adjusted gross income that's donated, it's the percentage of adjusted gross income of those who itemize their taxes, right? Because what we know, the, the data that we collect at the federal level in our taxes, the amount of contributions that get made is only for those who itemize their deductions. So we're missing out on a group of folks that make donations, but it doesn't get recorded in, in the data. I've done some back the envelope calculations. There was a time in North Carolina where if you didn't itemize in your federal returns, you were still able to um, uh, take the deduction on your state returns. And it was, we missed out on about like 1% or so. There's like a 1% or so difference, if I remember correctly, from what we find on the federal level versus the additional amount that was reported on, this, on the state return. So we're, we're capturing a, a fair amount of folks. Our key independent variables in this research the um, political ideology, the percent that um, voted Republican in presidential elections over 2008 and 2012. We could have done this the opposite way, the percent that voted Democrat. There's about 3% that sort of voted for others. Where we put that other doesn't change the results that we have, um, that we have here. And then we've created a, a Gina Simpson index about sort of competition around those votes. And then we look at, at tax burden as a way to uh, as a way to look at this relationship between donations and, um, and, and taxes. 
here's our nice little model. It's a nice little eye chart. Just to show we did do real social science when it comes down to it. Part of it is just to point out that we do control for a lot of those covariates of giving, um, income, unemployment, race, and, and all of those sorts of things. What are some of our findings? So one of the things that we see in terms of tax burden, the greater the proportion in the county that votes Republican, the lower the tax burden. Right, that's sort of not necessarily an unexpected finding to, to, um, to come on. So You're stunned, I know. I'm just joking, I'm just No, I, I know. <laughs> okay, so, so, right, so this is not an unexpected finding um, that, we, that we have here. What's a little bit more interesting, especially when we're controlling for that, is what goes on with donations. And really what's, what's from a policy perspective for someone who cares about philia, who cares about philanthropy, our counties that voted closer to 50-50 across those presidential elections are the ones that tended to donate the least. So on the one hand, this isn't, if I think about sort of some theories of the nonprofit sector, this isn't necessarily surprising. So Lester Solomon talks about um, sort of the the failures theory of the nonprofit sector. Um, that, that the reason why we have government is because philanthropy and nonprofits, the voluntary sector, isn't able to, to meet all of the needs of the folks. So he talks about there being four types of philanthropic voluntary sector failures. One is philanthropic insufficiency. If we look across our history, we tend to donate about 2% of GDP no matter where we are in our economic cycle or no matter what our tax, what our tax structure is. 2% of GDP plus or minus a couple of tenths of percent. Now in a $19 trillion economy, a couple of a tenths of percent is real money, right? But overall, we're not, if we're voluntarily giving and we think we need more than 2% of GDP to accomplish our, our broader public purposes, it's not gonna come only from philanthropy. A second problem is, um, the failure of philanthropic particularism. 60 to 70% of philanthropy is what's referred to, and philanthropy in this case, I'm talking about donations, is referred to as consumption philanthropy. We give to those nonprofits whose services we use. Houses of worship, universities, go pack, please make a donation to the institute, especially if you're an alum. We give to hospitals or disease organizations that our family members have been affected by. 60 to 70 percent of our philanthropy goes to those nonprofits whose services we use. Okay. Philanthropic. Um, oh man, I should give myself a test here. Um, there's the philanthropic paternalism is another thing, sort of a, the moralizing history of what philanthropy is. It's sort of that idea of the rich doing to the poor. And then finally, philanthropic amateurism. Given most of the work in the nonprofit sector is tr what we would traditionally call women's work, it tends not to be well compensated. And historically, it has not been sort of what pr professionally run. So because of these limits to the philanthropic sector, Philanthropy can't take care of things on its own. And part of what's going on down here, if we are living in communities where half the people don't think like we do, we're giving less. And this is an example of that philanthropic paternal, potentially one explanation of this is philanthropic paternalism going on. That we're more likely to give money when, we, when we've sort of sorted into counties where more people at least think politically like, like we do. Parti yes, thank you, I'm sorry, Particular, um, particularism, yes, I apologize, thank you. <clears throat> so this is a potentially little bit of a, of a concerning finding that we, have, that we have going on here. We can look at the interactions between um, the changes in voting and some of our predictions of sort of tax burdens and, and contributions. As you can see, sort of as the, the no-duh moment earlier, as the percent voting Republican goes up, the, the tax burden tends to go down. Uh, we see sort of a, 
that nice little V shape that we had here that, that with, high level, with low levels of Republicans in the county, higher levels of, of giving, um, and this, as we get higher levels over about 50% more giving. And then we see this general trend that if we look at this relationship, go back to that median voter theory, we can meet preferences through both um, taxes and, and donations. We tend to see overall the more heavily Democrat voting a county is, the higher the total level of redistribution is, and the more heavily Republican a county is, that is where we get the lowest overall levels of total redistribution going on. So this idea that um, the sort of philanthropic insufficiency idea is that if we believe there's a sort of right amount of public spending to go on, which is probably a good debate that we can have, um, that even in that highly Republican counties, we don't see as high a level of total redistribution going on or, or potentially services being, being provided. Five key takeaways from, uh, from the study. Overall, Republican-leaning counties do seem, on average, holding else, all else equal, donate at relatively higher levels than non-Republican-leaning non counties. Part of this, the second bullet point, some of this was a little bit controversial amongst our co-authors to say something this way, so I'll just pass over it because um, we don't know what's going on at the individual level there. Overall total wealth redistribution is higher in Democratic leading counties. Um, and then these last two bullet points once again get to that potential policy implication that's a little bit concerning. This idea of political competition, being in those mixed communities, right? That means we're, in, we're potentially engaging less with folks to solve our problems. Yes, sir? Did you factor in the, the cost of living values in different counties? I would love to have done that. That data doesn't exist. Um, we f I found some that was about 20 or 25 years old, and, and I didn't. That would be, that's one of the limitations to the study. We're able to do, um, Havens and Service were able to do that at the state level, but we weren't able to factor that in as a, as a limit here. But we did look at things like retirement income, unemployment income in the county to start to get at some of those potential barriers to people giving. Yes, sir. On the question of what economic what economic policy is going to be the Right. It could. So we've played, we played with a lot of different things in there, and it was robust to, met to which, which specification that we use. But it was things like um, unemployment rate, poverty rate. We looked at um, housing rates, um, mortgage, you know, total amounts of mortgage in areas. So we looked at lots of different ways to try to control for some of those, some of those sorts of things. But the findings are robust to the specifications. Yeah, I think that's in there, but I'd have to go back and, and look. That's one of the challenges with research, right? We did this about a year and a half ago. <laughs> and, I, and I read through it before I came here, but still not being in the thick of it, it's, uh, those details sometimes escape me. But good, good points. Yes? Did you look at the percentage who were retired? We looked at retirement income, but we didn't have, we didn't have the, so the, the retirement income that's reported on the, on the, on the tax forms we use, but I don't think we actually use percent in a county that is retired. For that, right. Okay. So this sort of gives you a, a rough idea of what, uh, of, of sort of what this research in particular is. And we can come back to that, but I want to go ahead and share with you a little bit of what the nonprofit sector and philanthropy looks like in, in North Carolina. I think that might be sort of uh, of interest. Part of it is, right, I'm a, 
I'm a data geek and, and I like this stuff anyway. Um, so North Carolina, three states in one. So, right, so we have this sort of nice um, sort of physical understanding of, of what North Carolina, North Carolina looks like. We got the, the coastal plains, we got the Piedmont, and we got the mountains. So I said, okay, if we have these sort of geographic differences, how, what does it look like in terms of nonprofits and, and philanthropy across the, the state? So one of the things that we can do, and this data is actually getting a, a little bit old because the sources of it are, are no longer um, available in an easily digestible format, but we're, we're working on that. So if we look at the total uh, nonprofits, sort of no surprising considering we have the largest population in, in the Piedmont with the Triangle Triad and Charlotte being part of there, that we have about um, two thirds of the nonprofits in the state are located there. There is no, you know, one of the things I talk about my students is there, there is no such thing as the nonprofit sector. It's a bunch of random organizations tied together by the Internal Revenue Code. It's pretty much what it is. So we can break it down in different ways. 501c3s are the charities, um, but this does not include, this only includes churches if they've registered with the IRS. So we're missing some of those numbers there. 501c4s are the social welfare organizations. 501c6, 7s, and 8s tend to be membership organizations. Um, so that's sort of giving an idea, and, and they follow relatively similar, uh, similar distributions. One of the ways to structure or talk about nonprofits is based on their mission area, something called the National Taxonomy of Exempt Entities, which is what this NTEE is. Without getting into a big long lecture about what this is, there are 26 different major mission areas, and within each of those 26 areas, there are 10 subdivisions, and within each of those subdivisions, there's a further number of 10 ways to classify organizations based on their mission. Some organizations, so like if you have a, um, an arts organization, which would be NTEE code A, there are some organizations that exist not to provide, um, not to be a museum, but exist to support museums. And that's what these infrastructures are. So they have a core code of 19 or less. And this becomes important, the same with NTEET which are, are foundations and other organizations that support volunteering. So these are sort of important infrastructure organizations for the rest of the nonprofit sector to do its work. So I looked at those separately. And we see an even bigger concentration of these organizations in the Piedmont rather than on the coast or in the mountains. What percentage of the 46,543 If I could do math, I could give you this number. In other words, if, if you set up an affinity group for the craft beer brewery. Yeah, uh, I'm in. No, but for example, <laughs> mm -hmm. if, it, if it qualifies as a nonprofit, is it really philanthropic? That's a really good question. And I heard an interesting discussion going on over here. And, and, and I've made some cracks at David's expense around hospitals. And should they really be considered as nonprofit or charitable organizations? Uh, one of my favorite nonprofits to hate would be the YMCAs. The YWCAs do some pretty cool things. YMCAs, we sometimes wonder about, are they living up to the community benefit? Are they providing enough back to us as a community to justify the tax exemptions that, that they get? Some are. There are some that actually live up to their, that live up to their charitable mission. Um, so I think you're raising a really important question. And there are lots of ways to have fun with, with the tax code. Let's not get into 501c4s and super PACs and all that sort of dark money and all that sort of fun stuff that, that goes on. But there's lots of ways to have fun with the tax code. Um, we can look at it if we go. These are all the organizations that are registered with the IRS. Many of them don't actually file annual tax returns because they, they're either um, using that sort of Monty Python quote about the parrot. It's just resting or pining, pining for the fjords, right? They're sort of, they might be dead, they might not be dead. But if we look at those that report um, income, uh, follows a relatively similar, um, similar distribution as, as, the, as those overall. We can look at nonprofit revenue. So nonprofits generate almost $60 billion of revenue in the state of North Carolina annually. Okay, Where so. Where does that revenue come from? 
Ah, good question. Let's make it. Is let's it make this. Or involuntary? Let's make it. Let's make it easy. There are three. There are three types of revenues that nonprofits have: a philanthropic, government grants and contracts, and earned income. What's the number one source of nonprofit revenue out of those three? Nope, earned income. Earned income is the number one source of revenue for nonprofit organizations. Now, if we think about some of our discussion earlier about what a nonprofit is, hospitals fall into that, YMCAs, that dark blue school down the road whose name I shall not mention falls into this as well, right? So it's that sort of fee for service. But even if we take those organizations out or we look in different mission areas, in general, earned income is the number one source of revenue for nonprofit organizations. Followed by government, followed by philanthropy. What percentage is the philanthropy? It's going it's to depend on which sector that you're in, roughly 20% overall. <coughs> if you look in an arts organization, it tends to be arts organizations, it tends to be higher. Once again, that idea of consumption philanthropy going on, driving a lot of that that's going on in the arts world. So nonprofits are big business. When we look at the revenue distribution per capita of people living in these areas, highest per capita income going on in the Piedmont area, followed by the mountains, lowest out in the coastal plains. So if we look at revenue generated per head, we seem to be over-resourced here in the Piedmont area. Um, and then we see the sort of least amount of resources, especially out in the coastal plains. And it gets even starker when we start looking down here in the infrastructure organizations. So not only are there fewer of them out there, the ones that are out there are generating less revenue, less money to feed into the rest of the nonprofit sector out in the coastal plains and in the mountains as well. So seems like we might have sort of three different nonprofit sectors across the state. When we look at it in terms of philanthropy, and this is where looking at, at being careful about how we interpret data becomes important and so this, some of the limitations of some of those other studies that I talked about earlier. Well, typically, because of data availability, we'll look at the amount that gets contributed and divided over total adjusted gross income, but that's not really comparing apples and, and oranges because there are different rates of itemizing going on in, in, different, in different states. So if we look at um, contributions on the itemized, um, adjust on the, for those who itemize in the adjusted gross income, we see overall almost $7 billion gets donated annually by North Carolinians. Okay, about $5 billion of that here in the Piedmont, about $1.3 million out in the coastal plains, and just about a half a, half a billion out in, in the mountains. What's more important is when we look at the, the, these ratios here. So overall, if we look at sort of, if we want to use donations as a proxy for generosity, we in the Piedmont are actually less generous than folks on the plains or in the mountains. So not only is there not sort of one nonprofit sector based on mission area, but when we start talking about the nonprofit sector across the state, we're making a mistake. We need to understand what the, what the local context are if we start <laughs> thinking about policies and, and those sorts of things, because that's going to drive a lot of what's, what's going on. All right, so with that, I have answer time, but really the only answer is there is no answer. <laughs> there, is there are discussions that we need to have if we want to reclaim that idea of philanthropy. It is yeah. not too long ago that in the county that I live in, which is a, coastal, a poor coastal county, uh, the volunteer fire departments were all uh, financed by, by contributions, personal mm -hmm. contributions. Uh, in the last 15 years or so, there's been a fire tax. Mm -hmm. I do not know the answer to this, but I'm wondering if, because of that, uh, has the personal voluntary contributions disappeared? And along with that, the connection of the, the citizenry that benefits from this 
with the institution. Before, there were fundraisers mm -hmm. and social things going on, and that doesn't exist anymore, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. so what's your thoughts on that? Um, you're pointing out a, some, a, a trend that isn't unique to the county, to the county that you're in. Uh, and part of it is this sort of disengagement that's going on with us and our neighbors. Okay, as we, as we, you know, we could go, you know, the, you know, the, the Robert Putnam route and say TV killed everything and, and killed social relationship. Maybe there's something there. But, but especially in the small rural communities, Right, part of that is, right, we know even from the public sector side of things, tax bases are, are shrinking. So it, it's not sort of surprising then that also the philanthropic base is, is shrinking as well. So part of it is individuals giving less, but there's also less individuals there to, to give as part of what's going on, and we'd have to sort of parse that out in, in particular. Um, but, but this trend in volunteer fire departments, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's going on nationwide. One of my doctoral students, um, did his research around um, sort of identity for volunteer fire chiefs, right? And part of the idea is what happens when you move someone from a line job to a leadership job? Um, how, do they, how do they change? And, and one of the issues that he ran into is that a lot of the folks that responded to his survey that he thought were all volunteer organizations, about a third of them had paid chiefs. And not just stipended, but actually full on, on salary. So there's lots of, of changes going on here. Yes? So kind of related to that, but generally I really appreciate the point earlier you were talking about the data collection problem, and in particular, cash given versus donated goods versus donated time. Mm -hmm. And when you were describing your nonlinear relationship finding between um, Republican ish. Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, um, it, it occurred to me that that research would be so much more useful if we could quantify donated time and donated goods. For example, I mean, donated goods is somewhat is included. Uh, not, no. And for example, the, it doesn't surprise me that if the tax rate goes up, giving goes down, tax rate goes down, giving rate goes up, but it's not a perfect correlation, so you end up with somewhat less than the institution mm -hmm. if it's voluntary versus involuntary. That doesn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. However, getting at what you were just saying, it's possible that in the settings where the revenue is being derived voluntarily, that also leads to social relationships that leads to more volunteer. Yes. That wouldn't be quantified versus No, you're right, and that's the, so we've been talking about what comes next with this research and looking at it uh, in terms of volunteering and this co political competition and volunteering is one of the things that we're talking about, but that there are even bigger data problems to be able to do that at the, at the to gather that information at the county level. We can do it at the state level, but we can't get down, we can't get good data at the county level. We might be able to do it at the MSA level, but then that messes with other. So we're trying to work through those, those data issues. But I think your insight is, is right. But, one, but I, I would actually flip it the other way. Typically, volunteering comes first. Donations follow. Right? You build that personal relationship between the nonprofit and the volunteer, and then you make the ask for, for donations. So I think the, the decreasing donations is a lagging um, changes that are going on in, in volunteering in communities. Yes? Um, I was wondering um, if in today's society, um, the tools that we have, like with the online giving, just as an example, like at church, they make it easy for us to just, instead of you know, having to carry your money with you, you can do it mm -hmm. online. Um, is that going to, you going to see a big difference? Is that going to affect it in a positive way? 
study? That's not part of that's not part of this study. I think that's interesting. So, and, and the some of the research that I've seen around that sort of online giving versus more traditional forms of giving, part of it has to do with that relationship that the nonprofit is building with with the donor. And most folks tend not to have the capacities to actually build that relationship. So it tends to be a one-time interaction rather than an opportunity to build a relationship. So we can think about how we can build relationships so it's not just someone tweeting back and, and giving $5. That becomes an important way to, to think about things. Um, so th there's not a, a good direct answer to, to your question, but that new sort of intermediated online giving presents some problems for nonprofit organizations. Yes? Will the increase in Potentially, yes, it, it will. So right now, uh, D David, David has really strong feelings of, about, about this. So right now, about 30 to 33% of people itemize their deductions. Under the change in standard deduction, that'll drop to about 5% of folks. There's estimates that this will reduce giving by about $8 billion is sort of roughly what that estimate is. Um, even controlling for the sort of stickiness that people have in giving to their houses of worship and, and universities. My bigger concern than that overall drop, because 60 to 70% of philanthropy is consumption philanthropy, is the distribution of that effect. So churches, universities, hospitals, especially since you know, that sort of university, hospital, disease organizations, those tend to be the higher net wealth individuals Right? We're all chasing those sort of large dollars. They're not going to see as large a decrease in giving as the food shelter down the street. So it's the distributional impact is going to be bigger for social service organizations than the nonprofit sector overall. So yeah, I think there are some real, con real concerns there. But at the same time, we know tax rate is only marginal in people's decision to give. It actually affects timing more than it affects, more than it affects amounts. Um, but still, it's going to be, be a, a, fair, a fair decrease. How about the mega nonprofits and the money they have? There's less of incentive to be a nonprofit than there was before the corporate rate was lowered. Am I saying that right? If we drop the corporate rate from 35 to 20, mm -hmm. and I'm a mega nonprofit national. Right. It changes, the, it changes my, my incentive structure, potentially. Pretend, right? But that all mad, right? Because it changes which capital structure you need to achieve your, your corporate goals. Yes. So there is a potential, a potential issue going on there. But um, that sort of demutualization of at least some of the mega nonprofits, it sort of works in the, it sort of worked okay in the insurance industry because we don't think of those mutual insurers as nonprofits. If we get into more mainline nonprofits making that change, I think there's a, there's a public trust that isn't necessarily monetized the way that you're doing that, that people might have, that people might give up. Great question. I have no idea. I, that I, I don't know. I don't know the data an to answer that question. So there's a couple of other limitations here. One is we don't know about political giving, and that would be really interesting to see how it goes on at the county level. We also can't separate out secular versus religious giving. We can control for religiosity in the county. So there's there's a lot of noise going on there that we can't quite sort of drill down to answer that question. But it's it's a really it's an interesting insight. If we can find the right data, then we could we could definitely look at it. Uh, have I no? Have other have other have other have other people? Yes. Um, it depends, right? It, and that's giving is cultural. Giving right? Giving isn't just rational responses to a tax structure. There are emotional reasons for giving, and there are normative civic duty reasons for giving. And we need to think about that full panoply of motivations for people to be publicly, to be engaged in donating and volunteering than just, than just the marginal tax rate. So that's why in some 
you know, some there high, higher rates of volunteering and and um, giving in Nordic countries, which are also high tax welfare states. So there, so right, there's not there's not that there's not that perfect because there's a lot of other stuff that's going on that drives how we can, how we relate to each other in society. And mm -hmm. levels of donations. Is there any research that helps us understand that, or is it just as simple as, as there's a lot of people in my community that I don't like their political activity, and so therefore I'm not going to help these people? So that's our conjecture at this point, but we haven't done the qual. So that's going to take some qualitative work to go in and talk with folks, and we haven't done that work yet. So I think you're asking a really good question. We can hypothesize about why that's going on, but we don't know for sure. Are you actually planning to take it? Uh, if, if we, yes, if we can get the funding to do that sort of work, we will absolutely, we will absolutely, we'll, if we can get the donations to help us support, to ask these interesting questions, we will gladly do this research. It seems like a really wonderful way to end today.